Hello and welcome to Historia Canadiana, the show about Canadian culture and the way it informs this nation's history. My name is Patrick and with me once again is the milkshake who brings all the boys to the yard, Mackenzie. Hello Hi. there, Patrick. Happy to be back. Thanks for having me. Always. Quick announcement before we get started. As we were discussing before the show, Mackenzie's going to be a more regular part of the show from now on. And that's cool. It'll give me someone to bounce off of and, you know, provide different insights. But that also means that it kind of validates something that I was planning on doing anyway. And that is take a small break right after this episode for our small but loyal fan base. It's not going to be a long break. It's maybe about a month just so that Mac and I can reorganize ourselves, plan ahead, or at least get on the same page as to what's coming ahead for the show. So we're going to end. I thought it was kind of interesting to end where we are now. It's at this kind of seminal moment in Canadian history with the rebellions. And when we come back, we'll touch upon its aftermath and its fringes and stuff like that. But I just wanted to warn people before we get into the show that this is the plan. Mm -hmm. Anyway, today we're going to be talking about part two of the rebellions of 1837 and 1838. Electric Boogaloo. Electric Boogaloo, exactly. Papineau Boogaloo, I guess. <laughs> that sucks. But yeah, we're talking specifically about Lower Canada today. And there are going to be two major figures that we're going to talk about. The first one is a political figure. As we just mentioned, Louis-Joseph Pepineau, who was kind of the Mackenzie of Lower Canada, the William Lyon Mackenzie of Lower Canada. And uh, yeah, I, had to, I had to make sure that I talked that about one. the right Mackenzie. The I'm not Lyon an McKenzie. insurrectionist. I'm not I an insurrectionist, know. people, I swear. I don't buy it. I really, I think you have a little rebel in you. Just, it just doesn't have a cause. <laughs> but anyway, back to the thing. <laughs> and anyway, yeah, so uh, we're going to be talking about Papineau, and from a literary and artistic point of view, we're going to be talking about a writer called Napoleon Aubin, um, who shared many of his opinions with Papineau, but I thought was going to be interesting to contrast Papineau with because he represents a bit more of the popular idea, right? The down-to-earth or common idea of the rebellions during that time, right? Whereas Papineau was a bit more in the higher political spectrum, the aristocracy, if you will. So I thought that was kind of cool to, to compare. Forewarning for our listeners, the poetry today and a lot of the people that we're talking about today speak almost exclusively in French. So I'll try to translate here and there, especially for the poetry, and try to contextualize in English because I doubt many of our listeners do speak French. But, um, you know, just to keep that in mind that we might speak a little French, and I'll try to keep in mind to translate as we go along. So anyway, just to kick things off, as usual, Mackenzie, what's your main idea or main perception about the rebellions as they were seen in Lower Canada, right? Or Papineau himself? What's your knowledge going in? The figures I knew less in high school, and I did high school in Quebec in Sherbrooke, and it was... There was definitely a major difference between the upper and lower rebellions. The lower rebellions get a lot more coverage and you're learning in Quebec. So the, there's a lot of strong Quebec sentiments where they were rebelling for the right causes. They were just, they were this, they were that. It's the evil British empire that made them rebel type of situation. My teachers thankfully were very good at sort of contextualizing that about because it was an English school in Sherbrooke. So they were very good at contextualizing like this is, what happened they were gave an honest sense of things but it's also been a while since i've heard anybody mention the canadian rebellions so you're probably going to bring stuff up and i'm going to be like right that that's what happened but i don't know a lot off the top of my head like papino was a vague name that i knew back in high school that you learn a little bit about for the most part we just studied what came afterwards Durham report all that fun stuff yeah and while there's kind of a reason for that, right? While the lower Canadian rebellions are often seen as being the more important ones, or at least the ones that had that were more explosive, if you will, much like the upper Canadian rebellion that we spoke of two weeks ago, it was kind of a flash in the pan moment. And the real 
changes and stuff like that, while they might have been instigated during 1837-38, the real changes and concrete uh, differences that you see happening in Canadian society happened like 10 years after. <laughs> it took right. a really long time. And so sometimes there's a disconnect when we talk about the rebellions and then their aftermath, because there's almost a generation between <laughs> the cause and effect. It's, yeah, these, these rebellions, as we call them, like, they were very small. They're only, they never last very long. Even this rebellion is two years. And like you said, like, they're, the consequences are for later. Even Papineau himself got more in power later after the rebellions than he ever had during it. When he came back from exile and became the member of the new United Legislative Assembly of the province of Canada. These are all things that are 10 years after the fact. He yeah. didn't get his power during. Same with uh, Mackenzie, William Lyon Mackenzie, back, back in Upper Canada. Yeah, exactly. It, it was a kind of them deciding to play by the rules until and, and change it from the inside once again, as they had tried to do before the rebellions and failed. <laughs> they had their rebellious teenage phase, and then Mother Country Britain scolded them and then they went, okay, we'll try doing it your way, mom. And then it turned out mom's way worked out. Yeah, but I don't think, maybe mom's way wouldn't have worked out quite so well if it wasn't for the rebellions no. either. No, anyway. well, it's like when you, it's like when you are a rebellious teen and you have to like, you have to make noise to get communication across, you know? That was the noise for Brynn to finally really like, okay, you have real issues. I will listen to them, but you need to like talk about this like adults now. What um, we just talked about quite a bit. So how about we bring it For back? Sure, yeah. yeah, just a bit, just to kind of have a bit more of a structure to the show. Let's talk first about the context surrounding just slightly before the rebellions, just before shit goes sideways in Lower Canada. In general, we see similar grievances in Lower Canada than what we were seeing in Upper Canada at this time. That is that the British aristocracy, the British power, was not really listening to its population, right? Mm -hmm. All in all, it was making decisions for them or limiting the decision-making capabilities of certain elected members. So there was really quite a bit of tension going up there. The difference with Lower Canada, though, is basically the French-Canadian element, is the fact that the differences between the elected members and the common people, if you will, and those with the actual decision-making power was clearer to make because they were very clearly French at the bottom and English at the top. Mm -hmm. And you can always find some exceptions, but in general, that was pretty much the major distinction to make in lower Canadian society. And that certainly helped fuel a lot of French Canadian nationalism that was rising right around this time as all these grievances were taking place. So uh, we talked a bit about this, I think it was episode 18 or 17, where, for example, in a literary context, we see a lot of new literature being formed. We see the, new, the first novel written in French and this will to really distinguish the French-Canadian element within British North America. And a lot more satire being developed against the British power and a lot more will to get a greater French-Canadian voice out there. So that's really the starting point where we absolutely need to make sure that is understood. There are rising tensions in both Canadas, but in Lower Canada, there is a French-Canadian nationalism that is rising at the same time. Mm -hmm. Now, coming back a bit to your point of not really playing by Britain's rules and saying like the French Canadians didn't, or the, at least the Lower Canadians didn't, quite follow through into going through the official channels to get changes done, there is some arguments to be made that that wasn't quite true. Oh, no, I was more just saying that they ended up having to make the noise because they tried their official channels. We know they did. Okay. We know guys like Papineau, James Stewart, and them, they, they tried political reform. And then they just weren't being listened to. Okay. I just wanted to make, uh, make sure that was clear, but all right. What was then known by 1824 as the Pax mm -hmm. Patriot 
or previously mm-hmm. known as the Parti Canadien, which again, we've touched upon in previous episodes, which was the first party in Canada's history. Before you just had a bunch of independent legislators. And now it was the first time that people actually united under a party. So what was then known as the Parti Patriote, which had a lot more popular support, by the way, than Mackenzie's movement ever did in Upper Canada. Oh, yeah. So much more. Right? They really were insane. the voice of the people. By all, for all intents and purposes, they were what a political party was supposed well, to be. And like they, you can just take a look. They got a flag. They have like, a, they have like proper signage. They have proper symbols, representation, and leaders that you can then look up and discuss and read about. Yeah. William Lyon McKenzie King, unfortunately, never got his movement quite as organized and never built up the steam. And so you have that party, and at its head, you have Louis-Joseph Papineau. And we're, get, we're going to get into a brief history of Papineau a, a bit later, but I'm just setting up where the rebellions are headed to. And so Papineau's party do try to go through official channels, and they do so most importantly through the writing of what is called the 92 Resolutions. These 92 Resolutions are basically demands that are sent by Lower Canadians through the Legislative Assembly, that is the assembly that's voted upon by the Lower Canadian Mm -hmm. population, to the British government overseas. They send this to London. And we're not going to read the 92 Resolutions here because There are 92 points, and nobody wants to read all of that. But the three most important points for us here are, one, that the Lower Canadians would like the ability to control legislative assembly revenues. They want responsible government, that is a government that's almost entirely beholden to the popular voice, and they want the ability to vote onto the council which at this point was still just nominated by the colonial administration, right? And had a right to veto the assembly. Now, I'll give you three tries, Mackenzie, to guess what the British administration decided to do with those 92 resolutions. Well, I'm guessing they stuck it somewhere. They stuck it somewhere real nice. They, they, yeah, they pretty much stuck it where the sun don't shine. And we'll, we'll get back to it, but not only did they throw it in the trash hard, but... They also just said, you know what? We're actually going to do the reverse. We're going to make everything even harsher. Because that's always worked for them, you know? Exactly. You know, that worked in America. Oh, we're just going to tax your tea even harder than you dumb nuts. <laughs> that's what you get for complaining. <laughs> and then here in Canada, we're like, yes, give me more taxes. Yeah. Next thing you know, you lose it all. We're going to get a bit to that later. But the 92 resolutions are sent. And spoiler alert, the British are not having it at all. I can almost just imagine the British being like, I'm not reading all of this. There are like 92 points here. No, no, just just send them like a quick answer, just refusing it, and it'll be fine. I didn't even know those colonials could even write. Why are they writing and not harvesting more furs? Uh, What was the joke in The Simpsons? I was elected to lead, not to read. Not to read. Number three! Oh, God. Um, Poor Louis Joseph Papineau. He tried. He tried. He definitely tried. But yeah, I don't know if you've read a bit on the life of Papineau before this. Um, Just a little bit. Little bits of background information. Okay. What do you have just to kick us off a bit? He seemed like he was like, he was pretty, as opposed to, again, our boy, William Lyon McKenzie. He seemed like he was a competent leader beforehand. Like, when he was elected to power, he didn't just try and make his people more in power. He tried to reform while he was in power again. He writes the 92 resolutions. He becomes the leader of the Patriot Movement. So that seems to me like he didn't just make this. People chose him to be the next leader after the former leader of Parti Canadien stepped down. And then they were like, okay, Louis-Joseph Papineau was our next guy. So it seems to me like he had charisma. He had leadership qualities. Yeah, that's a very valid point to mention, but there's something that I want to add uh, that we kind of mentioned at the beginning of the introduction is that Papineau is like Mackenzie in certain aspects and that he's an Mm -hmm. extremely complex character to try to pin down in terms of his politics. For sure. And while he will start this story off with a few basic ideas, as the rebellions will go along, his ideas will kind of shift much more, right? And especially as 
the history of Canada goes on and he comes back from his, again, spoiler alert, exile from the US, like his politics will change again. So it's difficult for us to clearly identify what his uh, ideology was, but we can kind of trace a history of changes that he goes through. Oh, for sure. There's also something that we should mention is that while people did respect the Parti Canadien, they did identify it as a party of the people, there's also a bit of hypocrisy in that Louis-Joseph Papineau was kind of an aristocrat in his own right, which is not uncommon for politicians at the time. And to be perfectly honest, is not that different from politicians today. Like a lot of them are still no. rich lawyers and stuff like that. It, it, it's not going to be the common man being the politician. Exactly. And that really informs the way that he will go along with this and especially the way in which he tries to deal with the British at first, right? because he is part of the aristocracy. He owns his own seigneurial mm -hmm. lands. He is his own lord. And he does have a vested interest in keeping certain things the way they are. So he's not an entirely radical figure. No. And that adds to the complexity of it when historians kind of debate whether or not he wanted the rebellion or he wanted to actually fight the British, or whether he was just swept up in this all. That's an interesting take on it. I can see that happening. Sometimes, like, as you get caught up in things, it just starts to get more and more, and you just sort of end up in a position where you're forced to do it. But the year, there are some things I would like when he, because he was sent to London to present the position of 60,000 signatures against the Union Project. Yes. That definitely speaks to me of his opposition. Same with the way, like, he had his radical ideas for giving political rights to Jews. First in the British Empire to even propose it. Yeah, absolutely. That's a very good point. Like, so he did have certain reform ideas. I'm just looking up. Yeah, so the, ref yeah, the union that you're mentioning, the petition against it, is actually an earlier union than the 1841 one that would happen mm -hmm. after the 1838 rebellion. So there was right. an attempt in the early 1830s. And like you say, uh, he was part of a petition to say, how about we don't? Yeah. How about we don't try and merge these two different sort of cultures and colonies Yeah, and squish them into one? And it kind of shows a way in which, while French and English Canadians did have, as we've mentioned since the beginning, a certain coalition of ideas of where politically they wanted to go, they still wanted to remain distinct. They wanted to yeah. remain separated from one another. They were two, in their mind, two different cultures. And I think we should warn listeners to keep that in mind because that's a very important point as we come back later in the aftermath of the rebellion and what people are told are the effects of that rebellion. There was actually a quote by Jean-Pierre Hualou, who was a historian and national archivist of Canada, that I think pretty much sums up Louis-Joseph Papineau's ideas. And I'll, I'll just read it out. It's a relatively short quote, and then we can go from there. So it says, By 1832, this complex man considered himself a Republican, a political reformist, and a Democrat. Yet, at the same time, he was a social conservative, defending the seigneurial system. Although anti-clerical and a non-believer, he viewed the Catholic clergy as a pillar of the nation. It was only his nationalism, his constitutional positions on financial control and decision-making in the colony, and his oratory that held together a party comprised of traditional and liberal elements. Right. So that point that you brought up earlier of him being a fantastic and charismatic speaker is superbly important. It's really going to make him the linchpin in all this, where despite the radical movements that occur, Papineau is still going to be seen as this figurehead because he is so charismatic and he can convey an idea with such clarity. And he can keep his group together. He kept his group together. The page, like, it's hard to keep in any sort of rebellion or political movement a whole group of people together, again, almost by himself by the sounds of it. And despite there being more and more radicals within the Patriot Party as the rebellions would get closer he would still manage to kind of keep it together until it all exploded. Do you have anything else to add about uh, Louis-Joseph Papineau in general? Uh, you mentioned his 
more liberal ideas with the Jews. I just found that a really interesting point that it kind of brings a new light for me because, you know, it's easy to take a look at the rebellions and say the French Canadians are trying to get just equality for French Canadians, but Louis Joseph Papineau trying to get equivalent political rights for Jews kind of speaks to the fact he just wants everybody to have a bit more political rights, except yep. of course, First Nations, but again, that's a whole other can of worms to, to take a look at. But it seems like he was genuinely just wanted more for everybody. I, I'm actually curious if he ever, I don't remember ever seeing that in my research about women, if he ever spoke to that. Probably not. I doubt it. No. It would probably still be focused on white adult men. But yeah, it is definitely, for his time, progressive. Oh yeah, the, like, the inclusion of anybody who wouldn't just be an adult white male is kind of impressive. And to me, that kind of speaks to why Quebec and Montreal specifically ended up having such a strong Jewish community because of how this was established so long ago. I just find that's kind of interesting thing to hear and see. Is that uh, ever something that, because I know you took a, a few Canadian literature classes and all that, and uh, I remember you speaking to me about like Mordecai Richler and Jewish communities in mm -hmm. Montreal. Like, was that ever mentioned uh, in one of your classes, or was that a discussion no. that ever came up as something going that far back? No, I don't think, honestly, I'm, I'm probably reaching at straws. It just seems like an interesting connection to make because Montreal has this long and strong Jewish history and community. And even, it just, it's kind of interesting to me that see, even going back to 18, the 1830s, there was things going on in lower Canada that sort of spoke to that same thing. Like it's a tenuous connection at best, but I find it's still a connection. I'm actually curious to look into this deeper. I know I had a few episodes planned on like the Jewish community in Canada and stuff like that as it developed. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I am curious to see because like it or not, Pepino would not have been part of the majority at this point. There was still a great history no. of anti-Semitism in, oh, sure. in Canada. And I'm curious how to see how that developed at that point. I should look more into that. With that being said, with that like basic overview of Papineau, I think we can actually move to our artist for today, who is called Napoleon Aubin. Again, I just wanted to touch upon him just because he's a bit more of a moderate and his political evolution will mirror that of Papineau's from a more not a non-aristocratic mm -hmm. point of view. And so Napoleon Aubin was actually a journalist and a writer who at times collaborated with the writer of the first novel in Lower Canada, who was called Philippe Aubert de Gaspé. So they, there, was, there was that mixity of ideas and this connection between people who all had this common will to develop a voice for French Canadians. Mm -hmm. And while I couldn't find it for this in, in time for this episode, or at least an online version that I could use, he was actually one of the pioneers, Aubin was, of the short story in French Canada. And much like his poetry, which we're gonna talk about today, he used it to basically vocalize some grievances that he had not only against the British power, but also radical lower Canadians and just lower Canadian traditions in general. So mm -hmm. he was not above satirizing people from all camps right? and just kind of being the ultimate centrist, saying like, there's bad on both sides. There's bad on both sides. I'm going to sit on the fence. His opinion was stay true to the middle, like the ultimate middle ground. <laughs> in 1837, so right on the eve of the rebellion, he would actually start his own publication, which he mostly wrote himself and published himself. And that's where you find a lot of his writing, so his poetry and his short stories and his journalism. And it's called Le Fantasque, which doesn't really have an English translation. It's not... Hey, if, if it's a name, like, you can't really translate that. Exactly. And it's actually one of the only lower Canadian newspapers to survive after the troubles that we're going to be talking about today. A lot of it was very similar to what we talked about with Halliburton a few episodes ago, and that it was mm -hmm. satire and 
very much based on caricatures and exaggerations of popular political figures at that time, especially in Lower Canada. Just to give you an idea of what his poetry looks like and what the general sense is in Lower Canada at this time, I want to touch upon the first of our poems from him, and it's called Les Français en Canada, or The French in Canada. And while I won't read it in its entirety, because again, it's all in French, I do want to kind of touch upon the major themes of it and see what we can kind of gather from it. Go ahead. Right. Sounds good. So the entire poem is basically a lament for the loss of relations between Lower Canada and France. Just with that idea, we can kind of see where he's going. And the entire thing, for example, uh, if I translated a few of them, would be far away sons from the same land, by destiny separated, dispersed. We all lament this cherished mother, her old glory, and our best days gone by. So that's kind of like the oh, wow. opening lines of it. I love an opening line. Yeah, right? It absolutely drips of romanticism. It's almost Shakespearean. Yeah, and it's very much attached to this French past that really wasn't his own. Yeah. What do you, what do you make of that in general? This um, just initial thoughts of his association with France and clearly distinguishing that lower Canadians and the French, while they haven't been together for like 150 years at this point, uh, no, more like 100, um, still in his mind share a common identity. It just, that speaks to the deep-rooted ideas of French Quebec, France, Canadian Francophone, or French Canada. Like, that speaks to how deeply and how strongly people identify with that culture. It, the 100 years of separation is nothing. It's almost a blink of an eye to them. And to me, that's kind of astounding that these people who weren't even probably, probably weren't even born to French Canada still identify this strongly with that culture. It's kind of incredible to me. It's, I don't know how many places you see that so heavily. I think that also comes back to what we were saying earlier about Papineau's ideas of, you know, this tradition of the French Catholic Church in Lower Canada, right? The British allow the French to keep these traditions and the seigneurial system and their language and their belief. Mm -hmm. They allow them to keep it alive. There's a brief period where they try to crack down on assimilating the French Canadians, but that kind of goes by the wayside rather quickly. Just I, isn't going to work. You weren't going to fight against the 70,000 or 80,000 French Canadians that were in that land by that point. Mm -hmm. Just to clarify my earlier scene for the audience, what I mean is that like they were a colony that then got recolonized. They weren't even natives who had been living on that land for thousands and thousands of years. Like the French colony had been there for 100 or 200 years, maybe. And they'd already established like these deep, deep roots. That's, a, that's an excellent point to, to remind people of. As you say, there's this deep rooted sentiment in part, I think, because of this 200 years of propaganda that New France kind of instilled in the soldiers that were settling there. And also just by extension, the later Catholic church that was allowed to survive and keep that tradition alive. And I think that also, if we look later in the poem, we can add an extra layer to Aubin and Papineau's thoughts by extension, where he writes things like, who seeks a bomb for open wounds, let's unite our cries and share our pain, we'll tell him while showing our colors. He's referring to the tricolor of the flag, of the French flag here. Mm -hmm. Our soldiers, sons of the great empire, united under a respected name. So while advocating for a deep-rooted tie, there's also in this poem very much a sense of wanting to fight for keeping these traditions. It's not something that he takes for granted either. Mm -hmm. So while it is a two or 300 year old tradition, as you're mentioning, there's still a sense that you need to fight for keeping it. That's kind of growing. I was just taking a look at some things because he's there advocating for the French empire, but I'm also taking a look at say where, when the, the French revolutions are happening. Mm -hmm. Just for example, just because I find it interesting that he's advocating for this old French empire, and they had 
they they had their king back, the Louis Philip the first. But for a while, they weren't really an empire anymore. At this point, they were getting out of their empire, and he's calling back to that old empire still. It's extremely nostalgic. Mm-hmm. Especially with romantic language. For, oh, for sure. The the style of poetry that he's using is absolutely indicative of his political intentions and his ideological intentions. Anyway, is there anything that you want to add about any of this that we've taken that we've talked about so far before we move on to the rebellions themselves? If you can find a picture of Papino, he's got some weird hair. <laughs> We were just talking about that for, for to, to give people context. We were talking about that before we started recording. And everyone who listens to this has access to Google, and I might put it up on the website. Is this um, Papino had basically the most 2005 hair of 1826? <laughs> right. His hair was as radical as his politics, honestly. Oh, for sure. I could see him wearing these three quarter jeans and dyed tips and listening to Blink 182. <laughs> God, that's a deep cut. Right? But yeah, that's my only other comment. If you can, take a look at his hair. It's, it's just mesmerizing. But moving on to the rebellions. Yeah, moving on to the rebellions. So we mentioned the 92 resolutions, right? The Lower Canadians led by Papineau and the Pats Patriot, which was still a party at this point. It wasn't a reference to an army or a radical militia. It was straight up a political party. Mm -hmm. They send the 92 resolution. And by May of 1837, the British government responds, which is a couple months later, basically. Yeah, okay, um, that's not too bad. I, th I think, that if I recall, the resolutions were sent end of 1836. Well, they just they wrote their own as their response. The Russell resolutions is what it was, wasn't it? Yeah. So the British responded exactly with what's known as either Russell or the Ten Resolutions. So the French Canadians have ninety-two things that they want, and the British respond with ten. And it's not even things that the French Canadians want. No. On the contrary, not only do they reject out of hand every single one of the points, but they decide that they don't want another revolution on their hand and to give too much radical power and reform power to the Lower Canadians. So they decide to even roll back further the powers that they already did have. So that's how that works. So you'd get nothing and you get less. You're getting more oppressed. Pretty much. What basically happens is the British government essentially takes effective control of almost every facet of the Lower Canadian government because they really want to make sure that they control every aspect so that there is no dissent possible. We kind of saw that in Upper Canada a bit with the reactions to William Lyon Mackenzie and his reform. He was constantly kicked out in the House of Assembly. In Lower Canada, they just, out of hand, they don't target a single person. They don't target Papineau specifically. They target the entire mm -hmm. reform movement as a whole. This is pretty much where the wave of discontent starts. And it's not like a tinderbox that just explodes. In May of 1837, it still mostly looks like protests. Mm -hmm. People are unhappy, rightfully so. All the hard work that they went through for the past decades to gain at least some voice within the British government and within the British colonial system has kind of gone away in the blink of an eye. And so there are protests that are constantly popping up starting in May of 1837 and for many months. This mostly resembles what happens once again in Upper Canada, because what happens is the British come in with the military and basically disperse every protest or as close to every protest as they can. At the same time, and this is where we're starting to see divergences from Upper Canada, is that you're seeing a socialist movement going on almost, and already you kind of see that the reform movement is kind of slipping and crack because there are increasing pressures by what are known in Lower Canada as the habitants, basically peasant class, mm -hmm. to demand better conditions, which includes refusal to pay the church tithes and seigneurial rents. So there's all these movements that are happening of attacking the British and attacking the system in general. 
of saying like, this is enough. People are taking, are seeing the cracks starting to form and are kind of taking matters into their own hands and using this opportunity to ask for as many changes as possible. Right. Does this pretty much fit with your idea of what the rebellions looked like in Lower Canada? For sure. And definitely like this is more Lower Canada versus Upper Canada. Because we really called Upper Canada flash in the pan. This is a bit more drawn out. This is people really being fed up with the system of what's going on, really trying to get legitimate change. Is that something that you heard about in your classes, the, the opposition to tithes and rents and stuff like that? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, not as specific as that, but there was this general idea of like the taxation was the major issue. And this fact that they were being overly taxed and all of these other issues was a large part of it. Do you see any irony a bit in Papineau being one of the figureheads and a kind of oh, leader yeah. of the rebellion and yet being a lord that is also being criticized for taking rent from his peasants? Oh yeah, 100%. This is Washington being a land plantation owner all over again, but still leading the American Revolution. It gives credence the idea that they were kind of forced into these positions. Does that change your idea of Papineau any? doesn't alter the way I see the rebellions, but it does alter the perception of him. If he just sort of got forced into this, it's all the more impressive that he was able to do something with it. It speaks um, more to his leadership qualities that he was able to adapt to his party that probably had very different ideas from him, but still be able to lead them. Especially in the midst, as I mentioned earlier, of there having some more radical elements being fermented in his party, that he was able to kind of still steer the ship as hard as it was increasingly <laughs> to steer the ship. He, and definitely his charisma is a part of it. But yeah, when I read this, I was it, it also kind of shifted my ideas of Papineau. I was like, oh, okay, this, this is a lot more complex than what mm -hmm. I remembered it. Because when I learned about this in school, it was very much talking a bit about taxes, but very little about Papineau as a landowner himself. And we never covered that. I don't even know if we talked at all about Papineau in my class. He might have come up as a name, but we did not cover him as a landowner. And that's kind of fascinating. It is kind of funny also. You can still visit his estate today. Oh. Yeah, it's near where the Rockfest is in Montebello. Okay. You can, it's a national historic site in Canada. It's, a, it's owned by Parks Canada. That makes sense, yeah. Right. It's very fascinating to go into, right? Because it's just so lavish. Right. And it creates such a disconnect with what you imagined this popular movement to be when you have what is ostensibly a mansion that even by today's standards, you'd be like, damn, I really mm -hmm. want this. I'm all about the people, he says, from his white porch behind his nice big fence. I, I think that was just one of the properties he owned that was like his main seigneurial land. Yeah, if he's a lord, he probably has like his city home, summer home, winter home. Yeah. I and mean, that's what you do when you're an influential landowner. For sure. So just coming back to the main rebellions themselves, as we mentioned before, Papineau's party was kind of the official middle ground. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty much under fire from all sides from the get-go, which made an even wider explosion, in my opinion, almost inevitable. Because you had the British putting pressure on one side, you had the peasant revolts that we've been talking about on the other, you had protests that maybe Papineau was on board with, maybe not. And eventually it was going to crumble. And so in the end of 1837, you start to see what are pretty much the major conflicts of the rebellion taking place. And they are pretty much kickstarted when the British call for the arrest of the major reform leaders, including Papineau. And here's where it gets kind of dicey, because as we've been talking about, we don't know how much Papineau was involved in the actual protests and stuff like that, and the will to, for radical reform. And so to have him be arrested, this figurehead kind of ignited even more of people's will to fight back. Fair enough. I, it's kind of weird for me because I don't know if it's because people either associated really strongly with Papineau and they saw him genuinely as a force for proper change, that if they put enough pressure, he'll be the one that'll be able to negotiate like terms. Mm. Or if it's because of an understanding that arresting him is a fundamental misunderstanding of what's going on. I feel like there's a bit of both going on. And it's also, and for some, it might have just been a nice excuse. There's probably a fair amount of people who were ready to rebel, and then they saw the 
the arrest of the leader and they said, okay, here it is. Here's the event we can use. We can spin this into now becoming our park or ignition or whatever. Totally. I mean, if you take a, take a look at most rebellions and revolutions, when they really start, the inciting incident is never huge, huge. It's more just, it's the excuse. People want to do it. They're ready to fight. They just need an excuse, any excuse. But I, I totally agree with that. So the rebellions proper, armed and such, kind of kick off after this mandate for the arrest of Patriot higher-ups. And a lot of these conflicts are led by more radical people. It's not the mm -hmm. moderates that are picking up arms. It's really radical leaders that are bringing people together with their radical ideas. And they continue to use the name Patriot, but the relation to the party is tenuous at best, I find. Because, like it or not, the term Patriot, which means obviously patriot in English, can be taken in many ways. Right? You can take mm -hmm. it into the ultimate nationalist sentiment and just say, this term represents all of us. We are the patriots. We are the true nationalists of this place, and we represent the will for change, and not necessarily the will to respect what the party lines are. What I find interesting is the radicals are taking the lead. Meanwhile, our poet is the ultimate center, while he's still being a reflection of the time, even though he's still the ultimate fence sitter of the political landscape at the time. I think that just speaks to how strongly everybody wanted the change for less of the British Empire. Whether you're a radical or a moderate, everybody and still wanted the same thing. One of the reasons why I chose Napoleon Aubin was exactly that, this kind of disparate nature that he shows, right? So people associate, mm -hmm. in Canadian letters, mm -hmm. he's kind of been associated with rebellion writing and stuff like that and being a representation of these changes. But if it was just up to him, very few changes would have actually been instigated. Right. So it is kind of interesting to see how people associate the middle ground with Papineau with Aubin, with these kind of middle ground and having a very coalesced view of history that follows a single line rather than all these massive and radical and unpredictable elements happening. And then mm. these people coming in and kind of talking it and trying to bring it into something more palatable. Mm -hmm. For example, if we want to take uh, some of these more radical elements you have figures like robert nelson or eb o'callaghan which were part of the patriot party and are names that are pretty important we're not going to cover them much here just for the sake of time <laughs> but they are names that if you want to look more into it were kind of influential elements in terms of taking up arms they're important figures i've actually been toying with the idea of just doing a, uh, an episode on the radical element that nobody really talks about, that few people talk about, mm -hmm. and see how that differs from the main narrative that we're kind of covering here. What so, happens on the fringes is always interesting to happen. If it, if it didn't happen on the fringes, everybody would know about it. Exactly. So anyway, there are three battles that really define the rebellions, and they all happen in 1837, and I'm not going to go into the details of them, in the sense that I'm not a military historian. I don't know right. about military strategies. I don't know about what is a good strategy or not. It doesn't interest me, and it's not part of the purview of the show. I, we're not a military history podcast. We're uh, a literary history podcast. Right, and we'll get back to, the po to more poetry pretty soon, but I just want to talk about the, the battles just because they are uh, well-known. They are points that are brought up often. The first one is the battle at Saint-Denis, one in Saint-Charles, and one in St. Eustache. And the only victory for the rebels here is the first one. It's the only one that they actually succeed in beating the British army. And in the other two, the British basically pulled up their pants, tightened their belts and said, no, nah, this isn't going to happen again, and crushed them. That first battle was them testing the water, basically, almost. Mm -hmm. It's exactly that. And after the first battle, also something very important happens that I'm sure had an influence on morale for the two other battles. If you think back to what we were talking about with William Lyon Mackenzie, and after the protests at Yonge Street that forced him away, what do you think happened after the Battle of Saint-Denis? What, Papineau? Yeah. He probably had to run. He wasn't at the fight. That's exactly what happened. Papineau also fled to the States. He was one of the exiled or self-imposed exiled leaders who was, as you mentioned, going to be arrested, and he fled to the States. 
where he was, like McKenzie, trying to garner support for his movement. You know me, always trying to garner support <laughs> for my movement. I was, I was hoping that we wouldn't, we would get through the episode without talking about the confusing name similarity, but it's okay. We'll just... I just like talking about me, okay? You and your rebellions. You radical. You yeah. anarchist. Less than Papineau. The dude fleeing to the States, but then also fleeing to Europe later. Actually, that's less radical. That's just more him being a lord, an aristocrat. Yeah. To be fair, he did, in both <sighs> cases, try to uh, garner some support for his cause. In basically the two places that a revolution did and kind of did succeed. As we mentioned before, though, there was already in France the return of the king under uh, Louis-Philippe, uh, who had already reestablished the monarchy and empire in France. So Papineau's support in France was almost inevitably nil. Non-existent, yeah. Well, even if he showed up during the French Revolution, he'd probably get nowhere yeah. just because they, they weren't in a state to give support. They had given support to the American Revolution, but that was before their own revolution, and it was just mm -hmm. to stick it to the English. And at this point, the French were, I believe, in a good place with the English, so they didn't want to rock that boat. Yeah, sounds about right. From the States, though, there would be, as we mentioned, Robert Nelson, who would continue some attacks towards Lower Canada and Upper Canada, much like Mackenzie and his men would do. And there were, again, some attempts to establish small, very faction-based republics within the borders of British North America. Because of all these conflicts, there was a whole lot of bloodshed, right? It was much deadlier in Lower Canada than it was in Upper Canada. Upper Canada. It yeah. was in Upper Canada, and it was really much more violent. And Oh, yeah. It had a lasting, a more lasting impact. And the fact that it probably played a large factor in Lower Canada keeping its French-Canadian roots so strong. For sure. Just looking at the numbers, it was... 73 to 130 dead on the Patriot side, 1,600 wounded or captured, 29 were executed for treason, and then 58 were sent to Australia. Yeah. Not great. Lasting effects. How about we return to some poetry? Do, do you feel like talking about a bit more of uh, Aubain and sure. see what his reactions are in the midst of the rebellions? Hit me. Okay, so there are two that we can talk about here that most directly involve the rebellions. One is very similar in titles to the first one we talked about. It's called Les Français aux Canadiens, so the French for Canadians. And the second one is called Le Juste Milieu, or the happy medium, if you will. So I think I'll start with the happy medium because it most directly acknowledges the problems that we've kind of been alluding to with the Lower Canadian Rebellion i.e. the problems of consistency and radicalization or trying to find a proper voice. So if we read uh, the first, if we read the first lines again, you see something like this. We exaggerate in this lower world and man is whole in his tastes, one sees beauty in the blonde, for the other the brunette is all. One mimics philosophy, teeming with knowledge, claims that no woman is pretty that ponders a black book. I prefer to all those systems, the greatest, the most precious. Friends, let us avoid extremes. I'm interested in the symbolism of blonde and brunette. That seems like a very interesting line. I don't know if there's some sort of national symbolism or some part of it where blondes represent one sort of people and brunettes another. Or if mm -hmm. he's literally just making a statement of some guys prefer blonde, some guys prefer brunette. I'd be very interested in seeing if there was any sort of background to that line. Not that I know of. From th There were colors associated with different factions, but they were blue and mm -hmm. red. Red would have been more of the reform members, and blue mm -hmm. would have been more of a conventional or Tory sensibility. And that the man knows what he's writing and how he's writing it. When he says the extremists in the lower world, it's a, it's a clever use of the fact that it's called Lower Canada in the first place. I also like, so the original line is L'un Saint-Jean, la philosophie. So one, uh, I translated it to one mimics philosophy or apes off of philosophy, I guess you could translate it to. Mm. I really enjoyed that line where you're taking these fundamental ideas 
or these great ideas that could be the foundations of a really well thought out society. And either you're imitating something that already failed, like in France, or I guess you could almost take it to the monkeys as like this brutish animal kind of thing. Right. Uh, you're, you're aping off philosophy. You're turning it into something it's not by battling it out, by making and it the radicals primitive. playing playing up his radical hate. They are just pale imitators of philosophy, which is kind of interesting seeing how he was calling for a return to French government and French empire. A little hypocrisy, but whatever. Yeah, exactly. I think it really gets to the heart of the complete inability to really make heads or tails of this rebellion as something mm -hmm. condensable and something that's easily understandable as one single thing. Yeah, the rest of the poem is pretty similar. Calls him out for being mediocre. He does directly refer to radicals and liberals, which he seems to make a distinction with. Mm -hmm. Sometimes liberals are referred to as the reformers, and radicals, I guess, are really the extreme liberals. But he doesn't really mm -hmm. refer to the conservatives much. There's a good line here that I can translate. So he says, radical in my love for her, liberal if I need to prove it. The way I see it is mostly him saying, I'll support the radicals because I love this country. I love mm -hmm. that people are actually manifesting themselves. But if I want to actually concretely think about this and explain my emotions, I associate much more with liberal ideas, right? The reform rather than the radical. And so, yeah, and it's interesting he uses the word love just because you're, you're passionate for your love. But when you eventually settle down, it does sort of, you moderate, you will be more liberal. Exactly. If we look to the other one, Le, Les Français au Canadien, the French to the Canadians, and this will be the last poem that we look at before we kind of talk about the immediate aftermath and what we can kind of conclude here. How about that? Sounds so like plan stand. one of the more important lines, I think, unite as your fathers did and the mighty will soon be beaten. Strong with your rights, you despise the hatred to your tyrants, oppose your virtues. That noble blood that flows in your veins O oh, Canadians, do you no longer feel it? Wow. Does this sound almost contradictory to you? It did for a second, but I don't, because I heard the contradiction when I first heard the noble blood in your veins. Yeah. But then if he's really calling for French empire, because that's his basis for everything. He seems to really love his old, his old French colonies. That would have been a lot of noble blood in them. So I can see that, I see surface level contradictions, but I find if you probably looked deep enough, you would find he isn't trying to contradict himself, or he might just be playing, saying we're the noble ones versus the actual aristocracy. I have a feeling that's more in line with what he's trying to say than... French nobility? Yeah, exactly. Because he is writing from a perspective of a lower class and stuff like that, so I, I doubt he would... I think he's saying we should strive for something greater than us. I think that's more of the mm -hmm. image that he's going for with the nobility. For and sure. it's in that sense that he's also using words like unite and we're stronger together and you know these people these uh the, these british in canada are tyrants but you know you have to actually want it if you want to instigate change mm -hmm. and that's where oh canadians do you no longer feel it right he seems to be almost saying they lost their zeal to change or at least to mm -hmm. legitimate change right then they would back off and just go about change the regular way afterwards. But as we saw, that kind of already failed. So I don't know where he's coming from with that. The effects of the rebellion did end up being that things started to change. It was just long-reaching effects. Because again, 30 years after this, we get the all-important BNA Act, which then gives them their independence more. Is there anything that you want to cover else of the rebellions themselves? Because there are skirmishes throughout, once again, making parallels to Upper Canada, there are skirmishes throughout 1838, but pretty much it dies out after the initial explosion of 1837. Mm -hmm. And there are reasons for that, which I'll cover immediately, but for the actual like conflicts and all, is there anything that you wanted to touch upon? I don't think so. We've covered everything that would be the most major point, I think. Cool. One of the reasons, I think, why the British were so effective in kind of containing this rebellion to a couple months essentially and the rest being very eclectic and skirmish like 
is because a few weeks after things started to go south in Lower Canada, they put in just in Lower Canada what was called the Special Council. Essentially, not too different from what would be what was happening in Upper Canada. It was basically martial law in Lower Canada. There were no no democratically elected bodies, no like, popular voices. It was the British that took over once and for all. They put Lower Canada under definitive and autocratic British rule for a couple months, I think, if I remember correctly, with all the power being derived from the governor general and his council, which is why it's called the special council. So there were a couple British guys which decided everything, and that's it. Now, where this becomes interesting is the name of one of those governors, which is Lord Durham. There he is, the man. Enters kind of like, if you want, the Emperor Palpatine of this little incursion. The one who's going to be kind of playing things behind the scenes from now on. Right. He wasn't the direct attack of the rebellions, but he's going to be the one that's going to shape the way in which the British react after it. We're going to say rebellions and Palpatine, and it's just going to be normal. Uh, but, okay, you find a better Star Wars analogy. Just no Star Wars analogy, but anyway. <laughs> I know. Lord Durham was our governor. Yeah, exactly. Uh, like uh, It was just to make a joke of it, but yeah, exactly. Lord Durham was uh, instigated as governor in 1837, and he put Lower Canada under martial law, and basically, while the goal was to limit the amount of insurgency that would happen in Lower Canada, as you mentioned before, it kind of helped solidify Lower Canadians against the British, even if it wasn't in a violent way. Because right? the mm -hmm. violence kind of died out after 1837. Papineau left for the United States. That kind of failed. Then he came back later. But there was never really any insurrection afterwards. Right. All it did was kind of create a figurehead, especially with what he would do after, which we'll get about with his report once we return from the break, and would kind of create, once again, this figure that the French Canadians could point to and all unite once again and say, okay, we've got to prove what his report says to be wrong. Mm -hmm. That report will not only do that, but it would also inform relations between Lower Canada and later Quebec and the rest of Canada to this very day, honestly. So just to conclude all of this, how about we start off, we've talked about it here and there, but what do you think poems can tell us do, the, do you think it's an apt representation? Well, I'll ask you the same thing as we did with the last episode. Do you think they're an apt representation of what happened? They, they seem to represent a part of it, at least. A very large part of, especially in the political side of things, whereas the Upper Canada ones had a bit more focus on the battles themselves. The poems you've presented seem to focus more on the actual political ramifications, political uh, fights that were going on, the difference between the radicals, the moderates, in that sort of situation. It, it shows more to the complexity of the Lower Canadian rebellions. If you were to compare it, for example, from the poems we did last week, how would you compare the reactions there in Upper Canada to seemingly the artistic reactions here? What do you mean the reactions there? Like, the poetic reactions that people are having oh. in Upper Canada, do you think there is something to compare here? Or is it pretty much what you'd expect based off of what we've been covering? And there's not that much to add. I mean, the Upper Canada reactions were a bit more propaganda-like, weren't they? Because that was what the writing was about. Yeah. These ones weren't so much a call for arms. They were saying, be passionate, you have to want to make change. But it wasn't so many words as, go fight for him. It was a more level-headed, I feel, approach to it. A bit more and subtlety at work. More subtlety. I think Aubin is a more competent poet than the anonymous one and Misato that we, we covered last week. Like you said, he finds this way to balance the complexity of the entire argument, but still not present it in its full that I don't think you got with the Upper Canadian Rebellion. No. All right, so we're reaching the end of the show here. How would you like to conclude uh, in terms of the historical perspective? Do you have anything to add to what we've been saying? Or just to final thoughts? I'm trying to think. Papineau did return to politics in Lower Canada. I think that's a really important point to make is 
he made a triumphant return after he was granted amnesty, which I think speaks to the complexity of the rebellion that happened in Lower Canada. The fact that this large central figure that people were rallying behind, he was eventually allowed to return to politics in a major role. It also speaks to what he ended up accomplishing, what this rebellion ended up accomplishing. I think that's a major thing people have to consider. Did you look up what his advocation was once he returned from the States? I, I'm curious how it'll change your perspective of it, actually, because one of his major points, especially after Confederation, was annexation into the States. I'm reading that now. Yeah. This and is... Aubain would also advocate for something like that, the poet that we've been covering. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't advocate for for being a distinct part of the Canadian landscape, they would advocate for just being completely swallowed up by the states. An Thank God movement. that failed. Yeah, first of all, yes. <laughs> but also, does that change the way in which you kind of see the way this rebellion evolved, or at least it's these two figureheads evolved? You can definitely see why their positions ended up changing. Papineau himself ended up spending time in the states, so I can see him sort of leaning off of that and this sort of idea of if we can't because he saw his rebellion fail for becoming a totally independent state so i can see him if he still wants to break away from the british government becoming part of the u.s would be the next best option but there's also something to be said and that's indicative of shifting perceptions of what the british empire is because yeah. we've never we've never done an episode on that but during the american revolution the Americans actually invaded here in 1775, right? They came up <laughs> to Quebec City. And one of the reasons why the, at the, that point, newly conquered French did not join up with the Americans, who did offer them the same olive branch, if you will, in their mind, of joining up with the eventual U.S., was mm -hmm. because the French Canadians saw themselves as potentially being assimilated into the American hegemony. And that's not right. what they wanted because the British were perceived as at least still giving them some freedom, autonomy. some autonomy, exactly, within the British system. And the Americans were not. And it's interesting to see how this shift has already started taking place less than 100 years later. I guess rebellion will do that. Yeah, exactly. It's kind of a radicalized image of what the states can potentially offer. Yeah. Just as a cliffhanger, on to what we're going to be talking about later. I want to basically say one sentence of the Durham report that will come out of the rebellion. So we mentioned Durham that was the, the governor general in Canada for a while and would be asked by the colonial administration to investigate what the causes of these rebellions in the upper and lower Canada were. And we've talked about that for two episodes now for like three or four hours at this point, right? So we both kind of have an idea as to what the general idea is, even if we haven't talked about the fringes that much or anything. Mm -hmm. But here is the basic gist of Durham's report, who states that basically the rebellion was not political at all, that it was the product of, quote, two nations warring in the bosom of a single state. And with that sentence, I think we can end the show here and just kind of let that sit basking in the bosom of Durham's misunderstanding so i just want to thank everyone for listening to this episode can mm -hmm. reach out with any questions comments or concerns we have a facebook page we have twitter we have an email set up we have all sorts of stuff right you can tell us what you thought uh what your opinions of the rebellions are you can tell us what you think papineau's contribution was if it was Mm -hmm. genuine or not what do you think Aubain's, uh, how would you interpret Aubain's poems I'll try to put the efficacy the of the the efficacy of the rebellions themselves it's very important to talk about that you can always support the show uh, we have a PayPal page we have a Patreon page that we're going to be working on during the break all this is optional and the show is going to remain free and independent even if you don't want to contribute that's fine we're doing it for the fun of having a more organized yeah. conversation also, during the break, if you have any suggestions about future episodes or topics, just send them over. That's great. And uh, I wanted to thank you again, Mackenzie, even though you're going to be a regular part of the show from now on. Uh, I just wanted to thank, thank you, you for being here. And with that being said, I guess I'll 
we'll both see you next time on Historia Canadiana. Cheers, everyone. Bye. Bye.